This morning, our Old Testament lesson is in the book of Exodus, and we are in chapter 16, starting at verse 2. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they get bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, What are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites. They looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there was a, on the surface of the wilderness a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So for the past few weeks, the Revised Common Lectionary has been cycling through this epic Exodus story. And many of us know this story, not only from reading the familiar text in the Bible, but perhaps more so if we're honest with ourselves from Hollywood renderings such as Charlton Heston's The Ten Commandments, or if you're like me and a 90s kid, the animated film The Prince of Egypt. We jump into the story this morning after God has heard the cries of the Hebrew people in Egypt and has acted to free them from their slavery under Pharaoh by sending Moses to lead them. After God has sent the ten plagues, after Pharaoh initially agrees to let them go, but then chases after them. After the clouds, uh, the pillars of cloud and fire create a barrier between the fleeing Israelites and Pharaoh's army. And after the miraculous parting of the Red Sea, allowing the people to pass safely and Pharaoh's army to drown. After this litany of great and mighty works done by God to fulfill God's promises, to bring the people out of the land of Egypt and into freedom, we read 
that the whole congregation of Israel began complaining. Complaining against Moses and Aaron and against God. And this isn't even the first time the Israelites have complained in this story. Like children on a long road trip, their complaints began even before their journey was barely underway. First, as they saw Pharaoh's army barreling toward them on the banks of the Red Sea, and then in the story that is just a few verses before this one, as they began their trek into the wilderness and found no water. But after God meets their needs in those situations, the Israelites are faced with this new challenge, and they still don't seem to get it. They haven't quite put all of their trust in God. It's been about a month and a half now since they packed up in haste and left Egypt. The provisions of unleavened bread have long been eaten, and now all they can think about is a rose-colored vision of the not-so-distant past where they had easy access to the stew pots and varieties of bread available to them in Egypt. Never mind that they were slaves. At least their bellies were full. Now before we get too judgmental about the Israelites' grumblings, we would do well to remember that their behavior reminds us of how fear and a lack of basic necessities often drives human beings into exhibiting our worst behaviors and actions. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I have never been really and truly hungry. Of course, on occasion, I've gotten busy and forgotten to eat breakfast or lunch, or maybe have spent an afternoon hiking or running around and leaving me famished. But I have never been legitimately gone several days without food hungry. Now, I know that when I go even several hours without food, I can get what my husband calls hangry. And when I get hangry, I am not the nicest person. I easily lose my patience and I start complaining. In 1943, psychologist Abraham Maslow published a theory that became foundational in our understandings of human motivation and behavior. It is now known as Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And in this theory, Maslow proposes that in order for a person to live what he calls a self-actualized life, that is a life that is completely fulfilled and lived according to one's fullest potential, that certain other needs must first be met. The first tier of this hierarchy is physiological needs. That's food, water, shelter, the baseline necessities. And the second tier is safety. These needs must first be met before one is able to fully address other needs, like love and belonging and spiritual needs. This theory over the years has been tweaked by others, but for the most part, it still holds up to modern day research and scrutiny. So what we have here in this story is the Israelites' very base needs of food, water, shelter, and safety being threatened, and their behavior being motivated by that fear. 
Of course, God already knows this and provides them with a gift that not only meets their crisis of well-being, but also their crisis of faith. What God is doing here is much more than providing food. The manna in the morning and the quail in the evening but a new way of life that is a stark contrast from their lives as slaves. A life that weaves in it, in its rhythms and routines, a growing trust in God through daily provision, labor, satisfaction, and rest. A new labor economy that is not exploitive, but provides everyone their daily bread. Trust and relationships take time to build and grow. And even though God doesn't need to continue to prove God's faithfulness, God knows that what the people need are not just the big, flashy miracles of plagues and parting seas, but the small, everyday, ordinary miracles of constant provision. God is shaping the people day by day through these routines of dependence, trust, and generosity. Today, the wildernesses that we walk through may look a little different from the desert and brush of the ancient Near East and the slavery from which we have, which we have been liberated from by Christ is the slavery to sin and all that separates us from the God who loves us and provides for us. In our culture of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and independence, where we perceive everything that we have as something earned and deserved and solely the result of hard work on our part, we can often and easily be led into a spiritual wilderness of ingratitude. We struggle for many reasons with the fear of never having enough. And in our fear, we complain. We whine and we moan and we are (laughs) ungrateful. And like the Israelites before us, our wilderness journey, we too are learning to trust more in God, to rely on God's provision. As we notice and take stock of all the ways that God cares for us, not just in the big obvious ways, but in the every day, breathe in, Breathe out humdrum of life. Some of my greatest teachers in helping me find gratitude in God's everyday miracles have been our global brothers and sisters. Those whose lives are very different from mine. Those who have much less certainty about life and accessing the basic necessities of life. Those for whom when access to clean water becomes a struggle, then every drop is a gift. When catastrophic flooding damages crops and causes food prices to soar, then what is put on the table today is a gift. And when political corruption and violence seems to be on every corner, having a safe place to call home 
is a gift. And every time I get to travel and serve alongside others in places like Peru and the Dominican Republic, I am reminded of these lessons of gratitude and simple living in the lives of those who welcome me into their homes, show me generous hospitality and a joy of deep faith that comes from living a life more fully trusting in and conscious of God's daily provisions. Many of you know that I served as a PCUSA young adult volunteer in Peru, where I only know, not only got to immerse myself in Peruvian life and culture and language, but also in the values of the YAV program one of which was simple living. A mantra that many of us committed to heart was live simply so that others may simply live. Several years later, I'm still trying to learn that lesson. What is it to have enough? And how can I be content I'm grateful for the daily gifts that I am given. And how can each of us in our lives live in a way that reflects the generosity of a God who hears our cries and complaints and the cries and complaints of the hungry and the frightened and acts to fulfill their needs? How do our lives reflect our gratitude for God's generosity? I pray that in our everyday rhythms and routines, we may continue to be led out of the wilderness of sin and fear, and we may find satisfaction and joy in our daily bread, in our labor, and in our rest, as our lives are continually being shaped by our trust and relationship with a God who knows our needs, hears our complaints, and acts with grace and love. To God be the glory. Amen.